Hi, my name is Dan. I grew up in North Carolina. I went to school at Stevens and I've been working here for about two years now. A lot of my life has been just keeping up appearances uh, despite being very depressed uh, for most of my life and um, and actually so basically in, in sixth grade I stumbled into porn and, and uh, rejected it at first uh, but then I eventually started to use that as like a comfort a uh, way to escape pain of like depression um, and since I still believe that God was this kind of really judgmental person I kind of felt guilty from that and then even from there more depressed um, from then I from there I used kind of relationships in the same way uh, and I went to eventually seeing multiple people at the same time and um, until I until eventually I really was unfaithful to someone I really cared about um, and at that point I kind of written myself off and sort of assumed God did the same thing as just being a Christian um, and I kind of lived much more apathetic and um, kind of more reckless and I kind of went into college uh, where I the first semester was kind of the same thing as I would have been doing um, but actually a friend's RA uh, Dario uh, you probably know uh, was uh, kept inviting me to church and it was probably maybe the 16th time I finally said yes I'll go um, and when I went that was the first time I really understood or started to understand what grace was so I was going to church for a couple of weeks and late one night I actually had, I couldn't sleep and I had a, a vision of God sitting in the corner of my room crying um, for just the pain I was causing myself, uh, my friends and the girlfriend I was seeing at the time. Um, and that, that was the first time I'd really actually seen God in that way. I didn't know he could feel pain or, or sorrow or, or feel it for someone else. And that was, to me, that was motivation enough to actually join a dinner group that they had been kind of promoting at the time. And uh, so I finally went, and it turns out I think the second night was a uh, time was open for, to share like a story of your life, how you experience God. And so I, that's exactly what I did. I was pretty tired of hiding this from people and hiding kind of like a secret life I was having. Uh, so I shared my story and it just kind of felt like I was bringing a broken toy saying like, can you fix this? Uh, and it, the crazy thing was two guys actually came up to me afterward and said, thanks for sharing, I'm going through the same thing. Um, that was kind of shocking to me as well, but also like a little crazy that God could just use my story right away and take something that I thought was just very bad in my life and actually start to use it for something good. Um, I guess over the past six years, uh, kind of since that time, uh, my life definitely hasn't been perfect. I, I wish I could say it was. Um, I'd actually been putting off my story uh, for a long time now because uh, I was ashamed of still where I was. Um, I, was uh, I still struggle with lust a lot um, or memories of things I've done um, or like, guilt from that or even um, finding comfort just in other things that um, always end up disappointing me or, or letting it down. Um, and there's definitely times I do find that um, comfort in God and it's an incredible thing, but I might even find myself right back struggling with something else again. But I, I this, this year I was able to look back in my life and just see every year that God sent me at least one person in my life to really show me who he was, uh, show different aspects. Um, and you know, then the, the greatest realization is that really that God sent me one person all along, that was Jesus, um, you know, sent his son to, and he was there the whole time, you know, through these people um, there being, not being okay with my position or what I was doing or how I felt. And just to realize that and see how God now works in my life every day, uh, despite what I do or, or what I say or, um, or where I am, it's just a kind of crazy and beautiful thing that makes me very excited for the future um, and very hopeful.
Very cool. Uh, well, good morning. My name is Anthony. For those of you who don't know me, um, I do want to thank Dan for sharing his story with us. Uh, Dan is my dinner group leader. He, uh, someone I consider to be a dear friend of mine. And uh, last year at Amplify, uh, which is our one-day growth conference we do twice a year, I teach a class called Story, and in it I encourage everybody in that class to tell their story within a year. Uh, so this week makes exactly one year since that happened. So congratulations, Dan, you got it under the wire. Uh, very nice. Um, but I, I love Dan, and I love that he got a chance to share his story, especially, uh, especially in the middle of this series. We're in week two of a series that we're calling The Fight. Um, and as you can see uh, from Dan's story and, and, and maybe a lot of our stories, we, we, we tend to fight a lot with ourselves, uh, this, this, this inner person that we, that we tend to fight with. And I mean, life is full of fights. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we thought the name The Fight was so pertinent for this series, because we're, everywhere we go, we see fights. We, see, we, we, we fight with each other. We, we fight with our family. We fight on social media. It's a terrible time to be on social media. People fighting all over the place. Um, but we fight everywhere. And, there's, and there's, there's other types of fighting. There's physical fighting, right? Punching, kicking. Uh, there's verbal, there's name calling, there's insults. I mean, I remember growing up, I, I had a lot of names uh, that were called to me in my lifetime. Uh, some good, some not so good. Um, I, you know, I had some cool nicknames growing up. A-Train, being Anthony, A-Train, that was one of my nicknames. Uh, you know, Tony, funny guy. Uh, Shakespeare was my nickname in Alabama because I was studying Shakespeare. They just lined it right up. Um, they said, yes, this is you. Um, but then, you know, I... Some names that I got growing up weren't always, weren't always so nice. Um, I struggled with my weight pretty much my entire life. Um, so Fat Tony was my name for a little while. Uh, since my name, some people would call me Tony, they would cut off the Y and I would just be Tun. Um, <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh, I was clever. <laughs> I was clever, I'll give that to them. Um, as much as it hurt, as much as it hurt after a while, I, I started to realize that this happens a lot in our lives. We, we tend to identify ourselves by the names that other people call us. And, 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 and one of the things that it caused me to do, especially in high school, was I, I just, growing up, I had this overwhelming desire to be liked by everybody. I, I really wanted to be liked by everybody. And it got to be so bad that I for, started to lose who I was. I mean, I, 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 I was the epitome of the double life in high school. Like, I, I was homecoming king. I was student body president during the day. But on the weekend, I was smoking, drinking, lying, cheating. I was crazy. I, 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 I wanted not to just be popular. I wanted to be liked by everyone, the jocks, the stoners, the nerds, everybody. I wanted to be liked by everybody. I was this type of person to, the, to this group of people, and I was this type of person to this group of people. And it wasn't just in high school. This would, this would follow me throughout life, this, this desire to be uh, who other people wanted me to be. And, and it, it, it caused me to lose my identity and to lose who I really was because I was, I was always trying to be who other people wanted me to be. And, and maybe, you know, maybe for you, it's not about being liked. And maybe for you, your fight is not with lust or, or, or porn, but maybe your fight is something else. I mean, I mean, we all understand and we can all identify with what it means to want to make a name for ourselves. We, some of you have some very impressive names names that you go by, president and vice president, CPA, entrepreneur, director, partner. Some of you are striving to be that name. Some of you want to be one of those names one day. I mean, we live in a culture that literally defines us by what we do, by where we come from. That's who they think that we are. I mean, uh, you know, what is one of the first things that people ask you when they meet you? What do you do? Who are you? Because we're so obsessed to figure out who this person is, where can we get, and where you're from, who you are, all of this comes into play. I mean, if you think about it, even, even the family that you come from can identify you. I mean, think about it. When I say names like Rockefeller, all right, Kennedy, Kardashian, you all have a name that identifies with a certain amount, some good, some bad, but like it or not, uh, where you come from and where you were born, sometimes it shapes the way that people view you or that you view yourself. Uh, crazy story, if you look at the, my dad's side of the family, uh, 
You'll see that my dad's name is Steven Reimer. My, his parents are Mary Ellen and uh, Robert Pete Reimer. And then above that, my great-grandfather on the family tree, his registered name is A. Reimer. A. Period. Reimer. He grew up, and in 1942, 43, when we were at war with, uh, in World War II, my great-grandfather's birth name was actually Adolf. And not to want to be identified with Adolf Hitler, he legally changed his name to A, A Reimer. As you can see, it, there's a power there. There's a power in the name that we give ourselves. There's a power in the names that we call ourselves. There's also a power in the names that other people give us. And, and, and the fight is really revolving around the story of this guy from the Old Testament. We looked at it, we, we kicked it off last week. Pastor Chris kicked it off last week with the story of the birth of Jacob and Esau. And, and really, the fight is revolving around that guy's story, the guy, Jacob. Jacob lived a life that was full of fights. I took a class last, last uh, semester, and we really dug deep into the book of Genesis. And, 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 and Genesis is 50 chapters long, and 25 of those chapters spans the life of Jacob. So I figured if 25 chapters are about this guy's life, we should probably pay attention to it. And what you see time and time and time and time again is Jacob's a fighter. Jacob's fighting with all kinds of people. And he himself was born into a famous family. Uh, if you look at the lineage, you see that his father was Isaac and his grandfather was Abraham. And if you don't know the story, Abraham was promised to be the father of uh, many nations. And, and at the age 100 years, he became the father of Isaac. And, and it's a great story of waiting on God and, and learning patience. And, and, and then you'll, you'll see, if you look at the line, the lineage, um, you know, Abraham gives birth to Isaac, Isaac gives birth to Jacob, and then so on and so forth. Down the line, it's the lineage of Jesus Christ. So it's a very famous family that he's born in. Not only that, everybody knows who Isaac is. Isaac's able to go to the king. He's a very prominent family. So he's already born into these people, the, the, this family. And, and we looked at this passage last week. And we looked at it from the eyes of Esau, his brother. Uh, but actually, let's look at it now through the eyes of Jacob. Uh, so Genesis chapter 25 is where we're kicking off today. Uh, we're looking at verse 26, uh, 21 through 26. And the first, uh, verse 21 says, So Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she wasn't able to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other, even in her room. So right off the bat, before he's even born, Jacob's a fighter. So she went to the Lord to ask about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And the Lord told her, well, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. So according to Hebrew custom, it was uh, the older child was the one that got the bulk of the inheritance. It got the bulk of, the, uh, of, of all the goods, of all the blessings. And then everybody else would, would be given what's left. Um, verse 24 says, And when the time came to give birth, Rebekah discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. So Esau is literally a Hebrew name, and it translates to the word hairy, okay? Um, like I said, they just called it like it is. Thank goodness that practice didn't translate to today. Imagine the names that would be out there today. Well, he's bald. Let's call him bald. <laughs> Let's name him Cryer. Um, so this is how it works. So the, and then, then Jacob was grasping Esau's heel. So they gave him the name Jacob, which is Hebrew. Uh, it's another Hebrew name, and it literally translates to, may he be at the heels. And it's, it's 
to give you a visual, it's almost like somebody who's trying to dog at somebody's heels. It's actually, the best way to describe it is through wrestling. Um, I didn't give my parents a lot of hope uh, growing up. My original choice of profession was to be a professional wrestler. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I used to love watching wrestling, and I used to, to do the real wrestling, not the WWE, but actually the real wrestling. And one of the things to do is to be able to get to the person, you know, you want to get your opponent on the mat so you can pin them. And one of the things that you do is kind of a fake out, little deceiving move. You go this way, and they'll go this way to, to, uh, to block you, but then you grab their ankle so that you're able to bring them down. You grab them at the heel. So that's really what Jacob's name meant, is that he's going to grab them at the heel, that he's a trickster, that he's a deceiver. And so, so, so just like us, Jacob's name began to define him at an early age, and he spent the rest of his life living up to this name. Uh, so we saw him last week trick his brother to give his birthright for a bowl of stew. And if you didn't listen last week, I encourage you to go on live stream uh, or check out, the, uh, check out the podcast from last week um, because it's a great way that, that, that Pastor Chris walked us through it. But now we're going to see that the next thing that he does is continues to live up to his name and trick somebody else. So Genesis chapter 27 is where we're going to pick up. Uh, and he says, uh, it starts this way. One day, when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, his older son. And he said, my son, yes, father, Esau replied, I'm an old man now, Isaac said, and I don't know when I may die. Take your bow and quiver full of arrows and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare my favorite dish and bring it in here for me to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. So this particular blessing, um, if you look throughout scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, there's a, lot of trans, there's a lot of words that mean blessing. This particular word uh, is, is a blessing. It's a patriarchal blessing. And what that is, it's almost like a, a will, if you will. Um, it's, uh, it's like, this is what's going to be your inheritance. This is what's going to be your blessing. And there's also a spiritual element too, where, where they bring God into the picture and they say, you know, this is also how you're going to be blessed through the line. So, so Jacob's already tricked Esau to get his birthright verbally, but Jacob wants to seal the deal, right? He wants to be able to, to, to make sure he's going to receive this blessing. And, 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 you know, and, and sometimes we do that in life. Sometimes we are willing to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get what we want. I'm, I'm going to get that promotion no matter what. I'm going I'm to make that person love me no matter what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and get that job. I'm going to be that partner. I'm going to head that firm no matter what it takes. And so the next part of the story, Rebecca, Jacob and Esau's mother, overhears what Isaac tells Esau. And Esau goes to hunt. And Rebecca calls Jacob over and is like, Psst, son, come here. So your dad told Esau that he is going to bless him. Here's what you need to do. I need you to go out I need you to kill two goats. I need you to bring them in. And then I'm going to prepare the best dish. I know how to make it best. I know how to make this food like your father likes it. Then you are going to bring the food to your father. Pretend you're Esau. And you'll get the blessing. Now, I've got to give Jacob credit here. Because the next thing he says is, what, are you crazy? That'll never work. Jacob's big. He's hairy. I mean, Esau's big. He's hairy. I'm not there's no way. There's no way. I don't even care how blind my father is. There's no way he's going to know that he's going to believe that I'm Esau and not Jacob. And, and, and as most arguments with my mother ended, this ended the same way. What does she say? Just do what I tell you. <laughs> he stamps his foot and he goes outside and he kills a couple goats and he brings them in the house and he says, here. And she cooks it just the way Isaac likes it, right? And then to take it a step further... She goes into Isaac's closet, I'm guessing, takes his favorite clothes, it says, uh, Esau's closet, takes, uh, takes Esau's favorite clothes, it says, puts it on Jacob. And, you know, we have to solve the problem of Jacob not being hairy, right? So this is what she does. She takes the skins of the goats that he just killed and puts them on his neck and hands to make him hairy. Like I said, folks, sometimes we'll do anything in order to get ahead. So I just imagine this. Jacob is putting on Esau's clothes, and then his mom comes with these skins of these goats that, she, that he just killed and puts them on his neck and puts them on his arms and says, great, go serve your father. And this is what happens. Continuing in uh, verse 18, it says, so Jacob took the food to his father 
Uh, and he's my father, he said. Yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? And Jacob replied, it's, e <clears throat> it's Esau, <laughs> your firstborn son. I've done as you told me. Here's the wild game. Now sit up and eat it so you can give me your blessing. Isaac asked, well, how did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord God put it in my path, Jacob replied. Little liar. <laughs> then Isaac said to Jacob, well, come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you're really Esau. So Jacob's like, oh dear, I hope this works. So Jacob goes closer to his father. Isaac touches the goat skin. The voice is Jacob, but the hands are Esau's, Isaac said. But he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt very hairy, just like Esau's. So Isaac prepared to bless Jacob. But are you really my son Esau, he asked? And this is important. Yes, I am, Jacob replies. It's about to get real up in here. <laughs> Jacob continues the charade. Isaac asks him to come closer to him so he can smell him, so he can kiss him. When he does so, he is convinced that Jacob is who he says he is. He's convinced that Jacob is Esau. And so what does he do? He blesses him. Well, Jacob gets out of there. Esau comes home and is like, I brought this back. Isaac realizes he's been deceived. Uh, Esau realizes he's been tricked twice, and he is ticked. Nothing can console him. It says that he is angry. It says that he threatens to kill Isaac. And so what does Isaac do? Uh, it's usually what I did when I knew I was going to get in trouble. He ran. He got out of there as quick as he could, and he fled. He did not want to be killed by Esau. And you know what he's got to be thinking boy, I really screwed up. I really, really screwed up. I mean, technically Jacob got what he wanted, right? But at what cost? It cost him his family, cost him his inheritance, cost him his blessing. Sometimes when we get things through ill-gotten gain, it doesn't always feel right afterwards. That's got to be exactly what Jacob's feeling. Now, and it says that for the next 20 years, Jacob stays away. Imagine that, not, not talking to your family, not, not seeing your family, not, 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 not coming in contact with any, anybody for 20 years. Some say it's at this point is when Jacob finally starts to realize who he is. So if he's going to be a deceiver, he's going to live up to his name. So for the next 20 years, he builds his own life. He starts to build up some wealth, right? He gets two wives. That's another message for another day. He gets 11 children. He has flocks. He has, he has, he has tons of wealth, and he's starting to build this up. He's got all of these things, but something's missing. Something's missing, and he can't, he can't put his finger on it. He's just He's got, I've got all this stuff. I've got all these things. I've got a wife. I've got houses. I've got flocks. I've got all this stuff. But, but something's missing. And then he realizes. It's Esau. I, I, I got to face my past. I got to. I got to go back. I got I to gotta face my past. And so what he does is he, he, he gets some of his messengers and he says, okay, I need you to find my brother. After 20 years, I need you to find my brother. So the messengers go. They find him. They find Esau. And they come back with this message for Jacob. <clears throat> Genesis 32, verse 6 says, After delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, We met your brother Esau. And he's already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Well, Jacob was terrified at the news. He divided his household along with the flocks and herds and camels into two groups. He thought, well, if Esau meets one group and attacks it, perhaps the other group can escape. He's got to be thinking of crap. All right, 
That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Years, years, 20 years have passed. And Esau, every year, has just got to have grown angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier. So he's, I mean, he's, he's living in great fear. He, his brother's coming to kill him with 400 men. So what does he do? He tries to appease him. He's like, I, d- d- give him some gifts. Here, I'm going to send goats. I'm going to send rams. I'm going to send cattle. Just tell him it's all from Jacob. Say, hey, hey, buddy, it's your brother. We're cool, right? He's panicking. He freaks out. He, he divides all of his possessions into two things. He sends one in this direction. He sends the other in this direction. And he says, well, if Esau catches up to one of them, at least half of them will have the opportunity to live. So picture this. He sends his wives, his children, all of his stuff. He sends it away. And he's in the open. And he's all by himself. Alone. And I don't know about you, but when I'm alone, and I'm alone with my thoughts, that's usually when I start to think about my past, the things that I've done, the things that I've said, the things that I didn't do. He's sitting there all alone. Esau's coming. He's frightened. He's scared. It's pitch black. It says that it is dark out there. There's no electricity. It is pitch black. And he's in the middle of nowhere. No family, no friends, nothing. He's scared. He's alone. He's thinking about all the things that he's done. He's thinking about all the things that he's said. He's thinking about all the people that he's deceived. He's thinking about all the people he's lied to. And then something incredible happens. Genesis 32, 24 says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. He's alone in the dark, in the pitch black. And out of nowhere, some dude jumps him. (laughs) Straight out of Compton stuff here, folks. Get, I mean, imagine, you're already frightened to death, and then you can't see anybody. Boom! He just comes out of nowhere, and he starts fighting. They start wrestling. They start going. And this is the crazy thing. He wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. They were fighting until the sun came up. They were going at it toe to toe. I get winded after 30 minutes of laundry. How the heck are we going to be able to get, do we get a fight toe and toe and toe? He's going toe and toe. The crazy thing about this is, is, is he's completely caught off guard. Verse 25 says, when the man saw, the man saw, the man who attacked him saw that he would not win the match. He touched Jacob's hip, hip and wrenched it out of socket. This is incredible. So the Hebrew word here uh, for hip is actually the Hebrew word for thigh. And it's believed in the Hebrew culture that the thigh is really where your power is, okay? So in, in a sense, the man touches his hip, uh, takes it out of socket, and, 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 and cripples him, takes away his power. But I love the way that it puts it. The man saw, the man, the man who attacked him saw that he would not win the match, Jacob's not stopping. Jacob's not giving up. Jacob's still going to fight with him. He's still going to go. He's still going to wrestle. But he touches Jacob's hip. It doesn't say he, he wrenches it. He doesn't say he punches it. He doesn't say he kicks it. All it says is the man touches it. And that has the power to wrench it out of socket. Jacob's like, wait a minute. This man's got some power. This man's clearly been restraining himself all night. Verse 26 says, Then the man said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now remember, pitch black. Most of the, uh, all night long, he's wrestling with this guy. He can't even see his hand in front of his face. He has no idea who he's fighting with. But then it literally begins to dawn on him. Because dawn is breaking. Who he's fighting with. The light begins to pour in, and the more he fights with this man, the more he realizes who it is. Imagine coming face to face with God, the very one who you've been fighting with all along, 
the one who you've been deceiving, negotiating with, trying to control, trying to escape. He's trying to control other people. He's trying to manipulate. He's trying to steal all his life. He's, he's thinking that he needs to get the blessing from Esau. He's thinking he needs to get the blessing from Isaac. This is where he got his identity. This is where I got my identity. I used to get my identity in other people. Dan said he started to think that this was his identity until he came, until God visited him in the dream, he said, until he became face-to-face to God. And, and he started to think about all the things that he was finding his identity in. He was looking for the approval of, uh, of his family. He was looking for the approval of his colleagues. He was looking for the approval of his boss. And he finally realized that, 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 that what Jacob needs wasn't all that. The problem wasn't Esau, his brother. The problem wasn't Isaac, his father. The problem was Jacob. The problem was him. He was being the deceiver. He was angry towards God. He had resentment towards his family. It was his rights. It was his wealth. And all of this belie- all this stemmed from what he, he, he believed he was supposed to get because of his name, because he was a deceiver. It continues in verse 27. The man, after Jacob starts to realize who it is, the man says, what is your name? And the man, what is your name, the man asked. And he replied, Jacob. Jacob's got to be in excruciating pain at this point. He, yet he still responds with his name. Remember earlier when we were looking at chapter 27, when his father, Isaac, asked Jacob who he is, and he lied to him. He stole that blessing, the blessing that he thought he needed, the blessing that he thought he wanted. And he said, who are you? And he said, my name is Esau. And now he is literally clutching on to the one person that can give him a true blessing, a real blessing. The one person, he's actually becoming true. The, he, he used to be this. He actually, he actually is in his name to deceive But for the first time, he tells the truth. This is who I am. I'm a liar. I'm a cheater. I'm a deceiver. Sometimes God's going to make us come face to face with the identity that you created for yourself. Sometimes God's going to make you come face to face with the identity that other people have created for you. Jacob was wealthy, he had wives, he had children, tons to offer, and he thought that this would bring fulfillment. But all it brought him was it left him homesick, it left him alone, and it left him at odds with his family. He was trying to earn this blessing. He was trying to steal this blessing, and he realized that all he needed was God. And then the next thing that happens is pretty incredible. Verse 28, it says, it says your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on, you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. God said, I didn't create you to be this way. The Hebrew name here for Israel literally translates to prevails with God, or quite simply put, triumphant with God. Jacob becomes someone who tries to have his own way through his deceit, but he becomes one who then trusts in God and as a result is triumphant with God. This is basically hope. It says God doesn't see you as you are. He sees you as you could become. Somebody said, oh, he doesn't see you as actualities. He sees you as possibilities. He says, I know who you believe that you are. I know who the other people say that you are. But this is who I say that you are. God's a big fan of doing this all the time in Scripture. When Jesus starts walking and and going through and making disciples, and he goes up to this, uh, in John chapter 1, verse uh, 42, uh, he goes up to... uh, He goes up to, then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, okay? Uh, Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And Peter, Cephas, means rock. And literally, Simon, the name translates to passive. 
So Jesus looks at him and says, oh, no, you're not going to be passive anymore. You're not going to be a wallflower. I'm going to build my church on guys like you. You're a rock. That's what happened when God came into my life. God started to slowly reveal to me who I really was. We can struggle with our weight, but that doesn't define us. We can struggle with porn, but that doesn't define us. We can struggle with all types of things, with finding our identity in things and in wealth and in other people and in our family and in our college. But at the end of the day, when you put your trust in Christ, God says, that's not your identity. Genesis 32, back to Genesis 32, 29, it says, please tell me your name, Jacob says. <laughs> and the man responds, what do you want to know my name? It's almost like God saying, you know my name. You know who I am. And then he blessed Jacob right there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. This is one of the most beautiful pictures about this story. This is this, this very visual and this very real picture of what had happened to Jacob internally was also happened to him physically. It's this picture of his new nature. Jacob, Jacob had been broken. His self-reliance was no more. If he was going to stand, he was going to have to lean on God. This is constantly with him now. This limp is always there with him. It's it's really a picture of grace. Something had to be broken in Jacob in order for him to be restored to God and his family. Listen, guys, God could choose to break us physically as well. But what did he choose to do? He chose to break his son. It's a picture of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. He, Christ was broken so that we could be reconciled to him. Jacob was broken so he could be reconciled to God. Christ was broken so that we could be reconciled to him. It's this amazing picture, amazing picture that, 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 that it, he shows that he is forever changed when he comes in contact with God, that I'm forever changed when I come in contact with God. He'll never forget this encounter. He'll never forget it. And it's interesting to note who initiates the fight. The man. God initiates the fight. We say it every week here. God's pursuing you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter who you think you are. God is still going to pursue you. And yet, sometimes he's going to fight with you. What has God got to do to get your attention? What names are you believing? What, what, what are the things that you believe that you are? If God can change Jacob's name from deceiver, liar, cheater, into triumphant with God, imagine what he can do with you. I did some research here, and, 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 I, and, and the scriptures is all over, it's all over scripture about who, who, where you can find your identity in Christ. This is just a few of them. This is, this is literally just the tip of, of, of all the things that, 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 that it says you are when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. It says, it says, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a friend. John 15, 15 says, I no longer call you slaves because the slave doesn't understand what his master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have revealed to you everything I heard from my father. You know what else he says? He says, you're justified and redeemed. What is justified? It's not just an album by Timberlake. No, justified <laughs> means that you uh, don't have to do anything in order to be okay with God. That's how I wrestled with him for my entire life. I believed that I had to do something in order to earn God's favor. No, he said, because of what Christ did on that cross, because you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are justified by your faith. And he says, you're redeemed. Because of that, I bought you back. I brought you back into this family. Romans 3.24 says, but they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He also says, you're righteous. Whoa, wait a minute. How can I be righteous? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. He says you're an heir of God. It's not a word that we use a lot. Oh, you're my heir. No, it doesn't really use that. But what that means is that we are part of his line. 
We are part of that family. Uh, Galatians 4, 7 says, so you, know, you are longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir through God. It's hard to believe. Listen, guys, it is something that I wrestled with, and we're going to continue talking about this next week, what happens when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. But it is hard to believe what God calls us and what he, he says to us. But if God can change Jacob, I'll tell you one thing, he can change you. He started to make me believe that I was more than just who I, who I pretend to be. He's more, I'm more than who people say that I am. He, I'm more than who I say that I am. It's that thing he says, I won't let you go until you, until you bless me. And Jacob realized that he was nothing from, apart from God. And from that point on, he was forever changed. <laughs> You'll never know what your life could have been. You'll never know what your life could be until you hand it over to the one who created it. Last week, Pastor Chris challenged us to fast. This week, I'm going to challenge you to go to God at least once, if not every day, and ask this question, God, who do you say I am? And if you've never been into a place like this before, and this is your first time and your friend invited you to church, give it a shot. Ask him, all right, God, who do you say I am? And cling to him this week. And next week we'll come back and we'll talk about what he says. And we'll continue to fight through this series. Will you pray with me? Father, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I should be called so many other things. But because we've put our faith in you, you've called us a friend. a son, and I, my prayer is for all of those here today who are wrestling with themselves, who are wrestling with their identity, and who, who are wrestling with you. Maybe there are people here that, that are like Jacob, and for the longest time, they don't even acknowledge you. They don't even think that you're there. But just like Jacob, you never stop pursuing them. And if they're here in this, let them know that you are still pursuing them. And for those of us who are walking, who, who have been walking on this, this path with you for a while, who have, who have walked into this relationship with Christ for a while, and we continue to struggle with our identity, help us to remind, help, help to remind us who we are. My prayer this week is that each and every person here will be able to take a moment with you and say, God, who do you say I am? We don't deserve it. We deserve to be broken. But because of what Christ did, you chose to break him. And because of that, we're redeemed. It doesn't make sense. But for that, we're, ever, for, we're forever changed. And we're forever grateful. It's because of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray.